Thanks for listening to Other People's Flowers. If you'd like to have your work feature on the program, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode. All this week's stories are by Mark Nash. Miso Soup He writhed at the first touch of the razor's blade. He became particularly frenzied when the handmaidens were threshing his pubic hair. So much so that we had to warn him to be still, lest the acuity remove his sex altogether. All in good time. We'll take this nice and slow. Our preparations were not to give the impression of any ritualisation whatsoever. We endowed him with some further follicles in fair exchange for the threshed pubis. Delilah weaved in plenty of extensions, doubling both the thickness and the weight of his thatch, tugging his neck downwards and making his muscles ache with the unfamiliarity of it all. We tried applying some false eyelashes, with particularly effeminate curl, but the sweat teeming from his brow continually degraded the adhesive, and so we abandoned the notion. Medieval torturers were wont to pull out their victim's fingernails, but we favoured the opposite approach. We attached acrylic nails to the bitten cuticles of his fingers. Then we painted them red. He moaned as they pinched the raw quicks like pillywinks. We chided him. That's what you get for a poor manicure regime. Initially, we plumped full clip earrings, but he screamed as the clamps bit home on his tender virgin lobes. One of our circle took pity on him and suggested some pierced earrings of post and clutch design. Maybe it wasn't pity at all. Maybe she knew we didn't have the requisite impaling instruments. Another of our colloquy offered the exquisite contrast of the stab against the squeeze by having one pierced earring and one clip on. We discussed the matter, and it was generally felt that since men rarely wore matching pairs, we did not want to reproduce such ornamental miscegenation. We settled on the drop pearl earring solution, necessitating first an ad hoc piercing of both ears. The chosen dangles were of sufficient mass so as to drag down the fresh flesh groove and incrementally distend the maimed flesh further. We draped bracelets, bangles and thick steel bands across his supplicating wrists, which were of so onerous bulk as to drive his beseeching hands apart and then prevent him from holding them up at all. Li Yu knelt down to asphyx the filigree train to bind his ankle, conducting its delicious agony of intangible tangibility, as the local skin's feedback sensors are sent into overdrive trying to calculate whether there was in fact any material pressure present at all. We plugged his navel with a heavy but cheap gemstone that probably leached its impurities straight into the omphalus of him. We placed a faux gold chain around his abdomen, whose verdigris stained the flesh green. Penelope set a heart-shaped locket around his throat, but couldn't get it to sit flush for his protruding Adam's apple. Nevertheless, its porcelain chill made him wince and brought out a local rash of goosebumps. Or perhaps that was merely dread. We debated whether to overload the décolletage with choker, necklace and pendant, but felt the unsightliness of such clutter was not representative. We allowed ourselves only one further adornment, that of a low-slung lavalier that impelled his neck to droop his head further down. However, Mother would not let go of her notion, so while the bedecking continued, we allowed her to hang the pearl necklace from the man's genitalia. Though she was charged with restoring it in place each time it slipped off with its stubby mounting. We idly considered a tiara crowning glory for our fashion queen victim, but felt it was a touch of overkill. Instead, we opted just for the finishing layers of eyeliner, rouge, and lipstick. His labia were dry and cracked, so the lipstick wrought its gleeful toil of granulation, reflectively drawing the response of the tongue like a spider to investigate a disturbance in its web. We paraded this, our first serving of misogynist soup, up and down impromptu street catwalks, where young studs gathered. None of his gender dared proclaim him a martyr to his sex.
Houdini VD. The illusionist clasped his hands together at his diaphragm in ham piety, as two black-clad stagehands brandished a straitjacket at him like bullfighters. His glamorous gold bikini a better snatched his wrists and wrenched his hand apart with a flourish, as if she was performing a conjuration of her own and a dove might fly free. The two assistants strapped him into his restraints. The woman then circled him with a wrap of chains, sinuously bending down to apply the keys in the padlocks. She then gave the links a yank to test their resolve, with a relish that prompted conspiratorial stage whispers in the stalls that the pair carried on the same relationship beyond the spill of the footlights. He ascended the steps with confined gait and pivoted one leg over the rim of the water tank. He swivelled his torso to turn and face the audience, took an exaggerated breath, before swiftly swinging his other leg and sinking to the bottom of the tank. A lid was placed over his indoor Davy Jones locker. His body started to gently writhe, like the fronds on a coral reef, wafting in the undertow. The chains bucked and twisted like metal seaweed on the tide. They're pumping oxygen into the tank for him! How does he breathe in it without equipment, then? Look, you can see the bubbles. You must have 40-20 vision to see that from up here in the gods. The PA was playing a heartbeat. Perhaps they had mic'd up the illusionist in the tank. The tempo started to increase suggestive of an urgency to the heart pumping. The movements from within the white canvas shroud were more spasmodic, though with greater amplitude, causing a greater swell of the water. The audience began to serrate their own breathing as they watched on. The torso and its tethers had stopped moving. Only one of the legs intermittently convulsed. The two black-clad assistants sprinted over to the tank. One scaled the steps, working off the lid, and handed it to his partner. Then he dived into the water, while the other took up position on the top step. Between the two of them, they levered the illusionist out of the water and manoeuvred him back down to the stage floor. The audience was hushed as they saw the water rivulets forge down the illusionist's still body. The woman ran over and threw herself down to her knees and started mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. No one now dared to speculate about this being an extension of their lives beyond the theatre. If he was alive, wouldn't he be shivering? Not if he's gone into shock, maybe? That's not very convincing heart massage. This is all part of the act. How can they possibly do it properly with the chain still on him? The water had stopped flowing from his body. There was no rising chest to impel it down inclines of his inert body. The stage curtain started shuffling across. Only one foot peeked out from under the drape. Utterly utterly still. Had they stopped working on him on the other side of the fabric? Wow, that was something. That's what you call a real showstopper. You're joking, aren't you? I want my money back. Why? He most definitely gave us a show, didn't he? Gave it everything he's got. Had. Dying on stage. It's the way to go for anyone in show business. Not comedians. You're awful, the lot of you. Man just died out there, for our entertainment. It's what he would have wanted. It's what his agent and publisher would have wanted at the least. The PA system announcement began. Ladies and gentlemen, we are sorry to have to inform you. The audience picked up their coats, started filing out all above. Too busy opining to finish their drinks or their toffees. They swarmed over the stairs as the volume rose beneath the high vaulted ceilings. They flowed into the foyer, whereupon they were confronted with the sight of the illusionist, not two-dimensional on the giant panels on the billboards, but stood there in the flesh, wet, shivering, shaking hands and handing out leaflets. Thanks for coming tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks so much. Had you going for a bit there, right? Don't forget to buy my DVD from the stall over there. Yes, all my best illusions are on there. You can spend as much time as you want playing it in slow-mo over and over again. You won't spot how I do the tricks. Thanks for coming out tonight. The Interrogation We've seen you. 
caught red-handed in the act. Got you on film. We just need the names. Who's that? Who did you just say? Stay with me now. What was that name again? Damnation. We've lost him again. Revive him. Oh, not now. Who's that? Oh. Hello, sweetie. Yes. Yes. Not now, love. I'm conducting an interview. I've asked you repeatedly, Sugar Plum. Please don't call me at work. Wipe that smirk off your face. No, not you, love. Just talking to my colleagues here. They seem to find something comedic about the situation. What? For a job? Yes. Um, a secretary. No, not. it's not a woman. Categorically not. What? You're joking. No, all right, all right. I'll do as you say. Bring him round. No, I was talking to my colleagues here. What? Well, um... He sat the other end of a long table, so he needs to come to the phone, doesn't he? Well, yes, I suppose I could go to him. Hang on then a sec, I'll go give him the phone. I'm just walking over there now. It's an awfully long table, my pet. We're in the, um, boardroom. Loosen the bindings. I was talking to the interviewee, Baby Cakes. Just how we're, um, prepared to be a bit flexible on the terms of his contract. What? Oh, that was just me snapping my fingers to, um, turn off the, um, video recorder. They don't need to hear our conversation. Yes, we record all interviews for training purposes. I know, dear. I'm a model interviewer and my technique is used throughout the organisation. Sit him up a bit. What? No, he's slouching in his chair. I'm afraid your call has rather broken the mood of the interview. No, I wasn't criticising you, my honey bun. What? Yes, I'll put him on the phone. Now, say hello to my wife, Mr Timpson. What was that? What? Yes, I know, Sherry. Grunts, yes, but... You could tell they were male grunts, right? Well, he was just uh, helping my guys move some things. His hands were full, big, heavy boxes, full of files. Well, we want to get an idea of how he responds to orders, don't we? Whether he's a team player. No, I can't just bring the guys over to our house to help us shift the lounge furniture around. It's unprofessional. And an imposition. Well, yes, I have the authority, but in truth, Angel, it's a bit of an abuse of power. I will do it, I promise. I'll get round to doing it. Yes, I swear on our children's lives. My treasure. Was there a particular reason you called me? I really must get back to work. What? No, that wasn't a whip you heard. Knock it off, you clowns. No, just my colleagues having a bit of fun at our expense, my dumpling. See, this is why I prefer it if you didn't call me while I'm at work. There's no privacy here. What? We've got a leak. Just call the plumber. Or get hold of the water board. Tell him it's an emergency. No, no, no. Take the towel off him. It's too much. Turn the hose off. What? No, I wasn't talking to you there, lamb chop. Towel. Um, yes, we had a spill here too. A cup of, um, tea. Don't want it staining the carpet. You've had to put towels down too? Yes, that is a bit spooky. Do you know where the stopcock is, kitten? That's not funny, boys. The electrodes. With all this water around, are you mad? No, not you, Fru-Fru. Look, Buttercup, I really need to hang up now. Just I'm right in the middle of this thing. You fools, you loosen them too much. That bang. I think one of the boxes of files just fell on the floor. Pick it up, would you? Set it back on the, um, table. Bye-bye, Button. I'll see you tonight, as normal. Other People's Flowers was produced by Hugo Gibson, Chris Kamon Vutitam, and Hamish Adam Kans. If you'd like to have your work feature on the show, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>